Man has traveled to the moon. He's explored outer space. He has studied this Earth from pole to pole. But only now is he beginning to understand the strange and mysterious powers said to exist in all of us. Powers known as ESP, or extrasensory perceptions, or simply psychic powers from the Greek word psychikos, which means of the soul, spiritual. We have all heard of these powers, of men who can bend metal with the powers of their minds, of thoughts mentally transferred through the air, of thoughts even being photographed. We've heard of spirits walking, of ghosts talking. We've heard of prophets foretelling the future, of psychic investigators solving crimes, of people's spirits traveling out of their bodies, of reincarnation. We've heard about these things, and some have been skeptical. Skeptical, but tantalized. Intrigued by the possibilities. In this motion picture, we're going to examine these possibilities. Our camera teams have traveled around the world collecting the evidence. Great effort has been made to scrutinize this evidence to assure authenticity. We are going to examine First hand of these phenomena are fact or fiction. From the beginning of recorded history, there is evidence that man has always possessed psychic powers. Proof of this can be found among the Earth's few remaining primitive cultures, such as the Stone Age Aborigines in the Australian outback. Anthropologists report that people here are capable of transmitting and receiving thoughts telepathically, often across hundreds of miles. Early civilizations like those in Egypt and later in Greece and Rome called upon clairvoyance to interpret the past or to see into the future. These clairvoyants were called oracles or soothsayers. And like people today, they sought visions of the future in crystal balls or in the bumps on a man's head or in tea leaves or in the stars. It has been man's desire to know his future, even his future after death, that has impelled his quest for the truth about his psychic being. He has relied upon psychics, sometimes called prophets, to tell him about this future from the days of the Bible to the days of Nostradamus. Nostradamus was a 16th century physician whose cure saved hundreds of lives from the plague that spread through France and Italy. He's remembered today, however, because of the poems he wrote, poems in which he foretold the events of the future. He foretold of the organization and failure of the League of Nations 500 years before it happened. He wrote about the rise to power of Adolf Hitler in the Third Reich. He foretold of the abdication of King Edward VII of England for the woman he loved. He predicted the atomic bomb. He predicted the end of the world in the year 7,000 to be caused by the explosion of the sun. After Nostradamus, in the dark years that followed in Europe and America, many who prophesied accurately or who achieved other psychic phenomena were thought to be witches and were burnt at the stake. Then in 1848, when the Fox family of New York communicated with spirits, psychic investigations became respectable again. Even Queen Victoria of England was attended by a personal psychic. And in America, President Lincoln is said to have attended seances held in the White House. Lincoln, thought by many to have had psychic gifts, had a premonition of his own death. In a dream, he rose and walked to the East Room. Who is dead in the White House, he asked. 
the president came the answer. He was killed by an assassin. Mark Twain, the famous American writer who also had premonitions of impending death, urged a scientific study of such phenomena. And in 1912, in England, such a study was made. It confirmed that 19 people had canceled their passage on the Titanic because of their premonitions that the new superliner would hit an iceberg and sink. Scientific study and documentation of psychic phenomena continues today in the age of Apollo, with telepathy experiments being conducted on flights to the moon. On Apollo 14, Captain Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, conducted several ESP experiments. He reports that he successfully transmitted telepathic images back to four people on the Earth. Mitchell is now president of an organization committed to the study of psychic phenomena. I feel that the study of consciousness and the study of mind is offering enormous hope that we might in the not too distant future, start to answer some of these ages old questions. Psychic research, or psychical research as it's more appropriately called, is one aspect of this. It is allowing us to demonstrate, using the tools of science, that there are faculties of man's mind that we have never understood as scientists. A very important set of faculties. There are many words going along with this, clairvoyance, precognition, ESP, telepathy, uh, psychokinesis. These are things that we can demonstrate in the laboratory, and we can use the time-honored tools of science, of objective methodology, to investigate them. The science for studying psychic phenomena is called parapsychology. And its most preeminent practitioner is Dr. Joseph Ryan of Durham, North Carolina. Here in one of Dr. Ryan's seminal tests, pioneered in his lab at Duke University, a sender is trying to telepathically communicate the identity of the cards to a receiver. Change. The series of cards is run hundreds of times to eliminate the possibility of chance. The results, sometimes averaging 18 correct answers per 25 cards, indicate that at least some people do have telepathic power. Two. Oh, there's two, right? Similar tests are used to confirm precognition, the ability to foretell the future. That's one right. Here in a laboratory situation, the subject is attempting to foretell the future by predicting which numbers will come up as a result of a random tumbling of the dice. Right that time. One. Hey, you got all three that time. This man, Jerry Termel of Lake San Marcos, California, does not predict which way the dice will fall. He has, under laboratory conditions, actually influenced their fall, moving them only with the power of his mind. We brought Jerry to this studio to see for ourselves if he can really influence the fall of the dice. Jerry, Dr. Landy will roll the dice. Now, you please call out the number you're going to force the dice to roll, too. I'll call the seven, sir. Seven. seven. By concentrating on the number, Jerry, with the power of his mind, can control numbers. the movement seven. of the dice, make the number seven come up. And the nine. Sure, waiting point, seven. Such controlling or moving of objects with mental energies alone is called psychokinesis. And Jerry has proven that he can successfully use this power 60% of the time, an average more than double that of chance. 
At the University of California, as at universities around the world, researchers like Dr. Charles Tart are making continuous efforts to extend the study of psychic phenomena. Here, Dr. Tart is attempting to send a number telepathically to the receiver in a second room. Dr. Tart is proving a new premise that extrasensory perceptions increase when the receiver can immediately see his success. In these tests, subjects hit with a greater frequency than before. At Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, new research is now being done in dream telepathy. While a receiver sleeps in another room, monitored by electronic brainwave machines, a sender concentrates on a target picture, trying to infiltrate his thoughts into the receiver's dreams. Michael, wake up. Um, can you tell me what's been going through your mind now? Yeah. I was... I was at a circus and was laughing at a clown in a big red suit. Uh, he was making me laugh. He was very jolly, and uh, he was holding these three big red balloons. And uh, oh, it was a holiday, Christmas or the 4th of July. Um, that's it. That's all I think. Uh, Okay, thank you. You can go back to sleep now. In the experiment that you just saw... Dr. Stanley Krippner. ...was a scene in Honolulu of Santa Claus during a Christmas party on the beach. The dream report from the sleeping subject mentioned a circus and a clown in a big red suit, therefore showing some correspondence with the festive atmosphere of the uh, Christmas beach party. Then when the subject went on to talk about red balloons and a fat and jolly man, he's capturing some of the color and some of the atmosphere which we associate with Santa Claus. Finally, the subject does specifically mention Christmas, therefore adding an additional correspondence to this particular picture. Another kind of telepathy experiment is this one conducted in Prague, Czechoslovakia where an attempt is being made to communicate taste. The subject, a highly sensitive young man who has scored well on other more conventional ESP tests, is being placed into a trance under the observation of a panel of reputable scientists. Once the subject or receiver is in the trance, a sender is chosen. He, in turn, selects an envelope which contains instructions as to which of several foods to taste. There is no way that the receiver can know who is going to taste what food until it actually happens. The sender, following the instructions, tastes pepper. Then, phenomenally, as recorded by the attending scientists, the subject actually tastes the same pepper. The experiments we have just seen, the scientists we have just heard, seemingly point to one conclusion, that telepathy does exist. But can we all transmit and receive thoughts without the use of our five senses? Let's find out. I'm with Dr. Edward Steiner, a parapsychologist who is about to test our telepathic powers. Dr. Steiner? This is a test that you and the members of the film audience can take to test your ESP powers. The test should indicate that deep down inside all of us, there are these strange and mysterious energies that we've been hearing about. All you have to do is concentrate. First, can you tell me which one of these two cards is the two of hearts? Now, this isn't a trick, so, so don't guess. Rather, just, just think. Try to receive my message because I know which one of these is the two of hearts. And I'm concentrating on it right now. That one, the one in your right hand. Good. Most of you uh, sense that this was the two of hearts, I'm sure. 
Now, here's a harder test. Two of these fish were dead at the time these pictures were taken. Can you perceive life in one of these still photographs? Or can you read my thoughts and pick the picture of the living fish? One in the middle. The fish in the center was and is still alive. One of these two cars is red, the other is blue. Can you tell which one is red? The second one. Wrong. The perception of color by telepathy is usually a good indication of a subject's ESP capabilities. It is one of the most common tests used in laboratory situations. Now let's see how you do on this next one. One of these women is the mother of the young boy. Can you sense which of the three women is the mother? in the red shirt. Very good. Now can you also tell which of these two young men is hang gliding for the first time? The first one. No, the one in the rear. First time up and not a worry in the world. You were right three out of five times. Perhaps some members of the film audience scored as high. It's not a bad score. Not even a professional psychic would have scored 100% on these tests. Even they are wrong about 25% of the time. Thank you, Doctor. Basically, what we tested here was thought transfer or telepathy. We have proven, partly at least, that we all have such powers. Now, we've all had practical experience with telepathy in our everyday lives. We thought of someone just as they called us on the telephone or said something just as someone else blurted out the same thing. But sometimes, telepathic communications occur in very dramatic situations, as it did with Diana Ryder of Illinois in 1975. Diana, age 27, is a secretary to a lawyer during the week, an amateur pilot on weekends. What I want you to do is enter a spin, make two or three turns, and recover on the entry heading. What if I black out? <laughs> Don't. I'll try not to. Just keep concentrating. Think of nothing but what you're doing. You'll be all right. OK, Josh, let's do it. Nothing in Diana Ryder's past could prepare her for the experience she was about to encounter. She had never before voyaged into the world between, never before sensed the mystery of the supernormal. With her concentration on a single task, Diana had freed her mind and opened it to a telepathic communication, a message that threatened to erase her concern for the job at hand. All right, Diana, level off at 6,000 feet. Diana? Diana? Champ 500, this is Josh. Do you read me? Diana? This is Champ 500. I'm okay. Diana, if you're worried, don't do it. I'm okay. Diana had to fight whatever it was that was trying to take hold of her mind. Here goes nothing.
With her task successfully completed, Diana now clearly received the telepathic message. Thank God. What she heard was a voice crying out for help. A voice so specific she could not disregard it. And something, not a voice, but something, compelled her to fly 70 miles to the northwest. That same something compelled her to land in an open field. Moments before her landing, a car on the nearby highway went out of control, veering away from an oncoming drunken driver. Diana, having landed nearby, was able to rescue the driver from the burning car. The driver of the car was Mrs. Cynthia Ryder, Diana's mother, the person who had telepathically cried out for help. Diana Ryder and her mother experienced an extraordinary extrasensory perception, as have hundreds of others. Theirs was a telepathic experience, perhaps the most common of all ESP phenomena encountered by the average person. Next to telepathy, the phenomenon that most of us encounter is that of precognition, seeing the future. We've all had a hunch about something or have had dreams that have come true. So it was with Donald Parker of Los Angeles, California. It was the only psychic experience of Parker's life, a premonition of disaster. I went to bed about 10.30. There was nothing bothering me. I wasn't worried about anything. I fell asleep right away, but I kept waking up. I kept having this dream that my son's house was burning. At first, I thought it was my own, so I got up and looked around, but it was nothing. So I went back to bed. Finally, I could stand it no longer, so I got up, dressed, got in my car, and drove over here. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I should have come over right away. It was just like I, I dreamed in a dream. The house, I mean, it, it's gone, burnt to the ground. Thank God my son and his family are safe. Can heating premonitions avert disasters? In 1966, in Aberfan, Wales, 35 people had premonitions of a disaster that took the lives of 128 school children. They clearly saw, before it happened, a piece of a mountain slide away, crashing into the schoolyard below. Dr. J.C. Barker, a London psychiatrist, studied those who had had the premonitions. None of them were especially psychically gifted, yet all had seen the grim tragedy that was coming. But there was no procedure by which they could use their knowledge to avert it. Dr. Barker wrote in his report on the Aberfan disaster, that if we could all develop our natural but unused extrasensory powers, we might be able to alter the future. We might be able to use our precognitions as a kind of early warning system. To that end, partly, and also as a kind of statistical survey about the accuracy of such predictions, a central premonitions registry has been opened in New York. Anyone who wishes to file their predictions there may do so already seen by correspondents of the registry before they actually happened have been the assassinations of Robert Kennedy and of Dr. Martin Luther King. Also seen were Rocky Marciano's fatal plane crash and the murder of United Mine Workers leader Walter Jablonski. 
These were premonitions by amateurs, so to speak, by people like you and me. The psychics who regularly see the future are monitored by the nation's newspapers and by television. Their success has been public and unusual. John Robbins, for instance, predicted the bomb explosion at New York's LaGuardia Airport four months before it happened. Helen Stahls predicted Jackie Kennedy would marry a Greek millionaire long before the public became aware of Aristotle Onassis. Clarissa Bernhardt predicted to within one minute the earthquake that hit San Francisco at 3 p.m. on Thanksgiving Day in 1974. Bernadine Villanova predicted the collision of the aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy in the Mediterranean in November 1975. Irene Hughes foresaw Senator Ted Kennedy's Chappaquiddick tragedy. British psychic Simon Alexander predicted the exact week of President Nixon's resignation long before anyone thought that event would take place. But the psychic with the most noteworthy gift of prophecy has been Jean Dixon. Since her early childhood, she's been able to foretell the events of the future. In recent years, she has astonished the public with her predictions of the assassinations of both Kennedys and Martin Luther King. A prophecy is something else. That's a revelation. No. Miss Dixon considers her psychic ability a gift from God. She is constant in her efforts to use that gift for the benefit of others. Senator Robert Kennedy, that was a forecast, that was not a prophecy. And Martin Luther King, that was a forecast, not a prophecy. In recent years, Jean Dixon has turned increasingly toward astrology for help in seeing the future. She is among the millions who believe that our destinies are interlocked with the movements of the planets, with the shifting of the stars. For his purpose and his mission upon this earth. Proponents of this ancient art believe that our personalities develop according to what sign of the zodiac we are born under. For instance, those born under the sign of Aries are energetic, enterprising, like Charles Chaplin and Thomas Jefferson. Victorians born mid-April to mid-May are stubborn and musical, like Barbara Streisand and Harry Truman. Geminis are versatile and clever, like Bob Hope, Bob Dylan, and John F. Kennedy. Those born mid-June to mid-July are under the sign of cancer. They are sympathetic and changeable, like Ringo Starr. Leos are proud, domineering, authoritative, like the Emperor Napoleon and Alfred Hitchcock. Virgos born the end of summer are methodical, like composer Leonard Bernstein. Libras are just, honorable, well-balanced, like President Eisenhower. Scorpios born mid-October to mid-November are independent, like Charles de Gaulle. Those born under the sign of Sagittarius are impulsive, like Frank Sinatra. Capricorns are ambitious, self-reliant, strong. Like Joan of Arc, to be born under Aquarius makes one honest, humane, popular, like Babe Ruth or Abraham Lincoln. And Pisces are sensitive, like Elizabeth Taylor. Can I have the knife, please? Not all psychics see only into the future. Here, Peter Herkos, a psychic investigator, is attempting to help a Metropolitan Police Department by looking into the past. He does this by receiving images from the murder weapon, hoping to reconstruct the crime, identify the murderer. The body was uh, murdered. The blood was in the bushes there. The girlfriend ran back in her car on a dead end aerial. Turn the car around. Herkos has been recruited by police departments around the world, including Scotland Yard. 
He was hired to help find the Boston Strangler. Did police work on the Charles Manson murders? Like, like, like a suitcase. She was stunned to death five times. Long, hot kitten. Herkos is not the only practitioner of this unusual profession. There are others, men and women, working on all continents. We are now going to see, close up, how a psychic investigator works as we follow the step-by-step -step investigation of one murder case. I think it happened around here somewhere. Yeah, I have the photograph, please. For six months, the police in a California town were stumped by what had become known as the Pier Murder. A 17-year-old girl had been found dead. The girl was about 22 or 23. I see her with long, dark hair. Maybe a little below shoulder length. Let's try it over here. By being able to psychometrize. That is, to read messages from an unseen photograph of the victim. The psychic investigator is able to tune in on the crime itself. She is able to locate the scene of the crime, to describe and identify the victim. Annabella, that's the name. So far, so good. But we know all that already. She has to tell you what she sees as she sees it. There are no shortcuts. I wish I could be sure we weren't wasting our time. I feel a stab wound under my arm down my side. There's no way she could know that. Nobody knows that. That was never released. What is she doing? Look at the photograph. At the position of the body. The psychic again senses information about the crime. How the body of the girl fell to the ground. How she was found. Later, using a personal object of the victims, the psychic attempts to secure more critical data. Often this information will come while the psychic is sleeping. Oh, I don't, don't. For this reason, her assistant always monitors her sleep. Oh, please, I don't know. I see her running. Oh, she's very frightened. She's running, running. Arnold, he's about five, seven, five, eight. He has short blonde hair. Oh, Arnold's very sick. He's diabetic. He's very, very sick. Oh, she loved him. She, she loved him very much. The information obtained during the psychic stream is reported to the police. Not far away. That's when you woke up. Is there a park around here? Could you get me a map? Like most psychic investigators, uh, she will work with a map, hoping to pinpoint a specific area in which the killer is working or living. She works with the map upside down. May I have the ring, please? Thank you. Again, using a personal object of the victims. Here. He's buying a gun here. Right here. Irving Place in 45th Street. There's a gun shop there. He wants to kill again. Who? Where? He wants to kill his doctor. Oh, wait a minute. I see horses around here and a, and a butterfly. That doesn't make any sense. But he lives with horses. There are horses there, lots of horses, and they're giant butterflies. Not anywhere near that pier do you see any horses. Are you sure there aren't any stables in that area? Not that I know of. Well, I'd double-check that if I were you. 
The images psychics receive are not always clear ones. Often they are fragmentary and need to be put together like the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. In this instance, the giant butterfly the psychic had seen was part of a large, brightly colored wall painting. And the horses were the horses of a carousel. Listen, do you hear that music? That's a carousel. Those are the horses. The psychic investigator has led the police to the building where she believes the murderer works and lives. There is a small room in the back of the carousel. We just want to talk to you. The most successful of psychic detectives is right about 87% of the time. Arnold confessed and was convicted. In this case, based on the actual files of a psychic investigator, the clairvoyant was also right, both about Arnold's sickness and the purchase of a gun. But she was wrong about one thing. Arnold said he did not want to kill his doctor. He bought the gun to kill himself. Because of their oft-times flamboyant roles in the solving of sensational murder cases, the psychic investigators become celebrities. Equally renowned for her psychic kinetic powers, but less well known to the public, is Nina Kulagina of the Soviet Union. Here, in an experiment supervised by a panel of scientists, she gives a dazzling display of her psychic ability. The scientists have determined that Kulagina's heartbeat quickens to 240 beats a minute while she is performing the psychokinetic task. At the same time, electroencephalogram measurements show that the waves emanating from the back of her brain generate 12 times more voltage than a normal person's. Back here in the brain is something called the pineal gland. Some researchers believe that, that it's here that the electrical chemical components of the brain get charged up, disturbed, redirected, causing a sharpening of our extrasensory powers. Why does that gland work for some people and not for others? Well, I, I guess it's a trick of nature. For some of us are born with this gland bursting with power. Others are born with it inactive. Others, like, like Peter Herkos, suffer an injury that causes this gland to come to life. That's only theory, isn't it? Still unproven? Yes, yes, that's true. But, but what is proven is that we are made up of the same things as the stars. We are energy, like electricity. This energy pours out of us, sometimes against our will. seems to have a mind of its own. Mr. and Mrs. Mike Rogers of a small town in Florida knew nothing about such psychokinetic energies when suddenly objects in their house began to mysteriously move. Easy, honey. Easy, dear. Their phone began to mysteriously ring. Hello? Hello? Hello! Third time tonight. There's no one there. They did not know then about the powers of human energy. Oh. 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 
Parapsychologists were called in to investigate the strange happenings in the Rogers household. First, to determine if the house were haunted. Second, to see if psychokinetic energies were being unknowingly unleashed. Oh, the pictures are always moving by themselves on the walls and the light bulbs explode. And the papers are flying. <laughs> What they learned was that Mrs. Rogers was energizing things, moving them unconsciously with the power of her mind. Such psychokinetic powers are not as rare as they might seem. Children often unconsciously act out their hostility toward their parents in this manner. Or, as in the Rogers household, wives act out their hostilities toward their husbands. These powers also one day mysteriously abate, go away as strangely as they had once appeared. In Mrs. Rogers' case, she came to understand what was happening to her and resolved her problems with her husband, and today lives in a quiet, normal household. Another kind of psychokinesis is that practiced by a former Chicago bellhop, Ted Sirios. Sirios is capable of impressing his mental images on unexposed film. He takes pictures of his thoughts. His feats have been performed under the supervision of a noted psychiatrist at the University of Colorado, Dr. Jewel Eisenberg. In this dazzling display of mind over matter, Sirios points a camera at his head, and instead of getting a picture of his head, gets an image of the thoughts inside. A panel of 25 scientists was invited to observe Sirius attempt his psychic photography. Later, all 25 signed statements that the experiments were valid, agreed that every safeguard had been taken to protect the integrity of the test. Here are some of the results of those experiments. In each of them, subjects tried to communicate target pictures to Sirio's telepathically. Then pictures were taken of Sirio's head. The first target picture was the Twin Towered Cathedral in Munich, West Germany. A photograph taken of Sirio's head resulted in this exposure on the negative. The target, a livery stable. Sirio's mind photograph. Here the target was Trajan's column in Rome. Sirio scored twice, with the column and with the dome. This photograph of a medieval town resulted in an obscure image. But this picture of the Air Force's projected manned orbiting lab looked like this as it was photographed inside Ted Sirio's head. The work of psychics like Ted Sirio's is now being chronicled and stored for research purposes, just as was the work of America's most revered psychic, the late Edgar Cayce. Here at the Association for Research and Enlightenment at Virginia Beach, thousands of documents attest to Casey's phenomenal success as a psychic medical diagnostician. Known as the sleeping prophet because his visions came to him in a sleep-like trance, Casey, without any medical training and with no formal education, could diagnose and prescribe cures for illnesses of all kinds. He did this without ever having seen his patients. He discovered his rare gift when he found the cure for his own voice paralysis during a self-induced hypnosis. He later prescribed successful cures for his son's eye disease and his wife's tuberculosis. Today, his son, 
Hugh Lynn Casey administers the Edgar Casey Foundation. He tells us about his father. Edgar Casey was always in conflict with what he was doing. He didn't understand it in the beginning. He was troubled over the possibility that some of the information he was giving for people who sought him out would hurt them in some way. And not until the readings began to provide help for him, for his wife, and for me, when I burned my eyes severely, did he begin to devote all of his time to it and commit himself to actually giving readings whenever people ask him. He was a photographer by trade and didn't do this for money. He was seeking to help people. He said, very simply, as long as people ask me, I will try. If ever one of these hurts anyone, I'll never do another one. And I think he lived by that all of his life. Each day for 43 years, Edgar Casey, a fifth grade dropout, would stop his gardening or come in from his fishing to do his readings. The names and addresses of his patients and their problems were unknown to him and would remain unknown to him until he placed himself into his sleep-like trance. The name of today's subject is Miriam Roper. And at this moment, she is at 2745 Ashland Avenue, Vero Beach, Florida. In his trance, Casey would locate the patient, often thousands of miles away, and diagnose the illness. Yes. yes. We see her. We do not know her. We have never seen her before. He attributed his unparalleled powers to an eternal light that he encountered while in his trance-like state. We, we find that this body is not very good. Not correct in every respect. We find... In some cases, disorders. the sleeping prophet mentioned medicines unknown to modern science. Research would later show such medicines to have been ancient cures, long forgotten. Balance metabolism. In the cerebrospinal system, we find there is something wrong with the... He believed that the center of the body was its nervous system and sought to treat that, often with home-style folk cures. To... 16 ounces of water, add one ounce of dried wild ginseng root. He believed in healing the whole person, body, mind, and soul. And in 36 to 40 when Casey awoke, he remembered nothing of what had transpired during the trance. Would not have understood it if we were told it. Ready for question. The stenographic account was then mailed to the patient, and according to the records, in over 14,000 cases, the diagnosis and treatments were always correct. So it was with Miriam Roper. Though singular because of his range and character, Edgar Casey was not the only person to heal through the wonders of psychic powers. The late Catherine Kuhlman was one such healer. Faith healers like Catherine Kuhlman are by definition psychic. Put it up now. Swing that arm now to the hard you can. Parapsychologists say that they help the patients impose their own minds over their bodies. During a recent week-long meeting in Jerusalem, one woman tells how Catherine Kuhlman mobilized her psychic energies to effect the cure. But uh, when she pointed up in the balcony for me, <laughs> Jesus healed me in a moment. 
And, um, and now what? No pain. I'm completely healed. And, and that was two days ago. Two days ago, yes. Yeah. Still with no pain. No pain. No pain. Praise the Lord. Olga Warhol is another prominent faith healer. Her laying on of the hands has caused many of the men and women who flock to her to walk away whole once again. To determine if there really is a healing energy flowing from Olga's hands, Sister N. Justice Smith, one of the nation's leading biochemists, has set up an experiment in her labs at Rosary Hill College in Buffalo, New York. Sister Smith hopes to determine if enzymes, the proteins which trigger chemical reactions within the human body, will be affected when held by Olga Warhol. The results of the experiment show that the activity of the enzymes increases substantially when held by Olga Warhol. They react in the same way as they do when subjected to a high magnetic field. There really is nothing supernatural, nor mysterious, nor occult about paranormal healing. It can be tested and measured and demonstrated in a scientific laboratory. Now you see, when there is greater tension, of course... The because of the progress being made through the study of psychic healing, a new science of consciousness is being introduced to help people help themselves. Called biofeedback, it teaches the patient to control or even alter his bodily processes to fight off illness. Less tension. Yes, I see. Any questions? Modern medicine is being forced to re-examine its concepts of healing. Today, they are re-evaluating ancient psychic energy procedures such as acupuncture. This point, which is called a governor, vessel point and it's located right in the middle. Sometimes it hurts just a little bit. Based on the energy the Chinese call chai, the procedure calls for the circuiting and recircuiting of the electrical impulses in our body. There is also something called psychic acupuncture. Well, Ethel, it's diagnosed as some long name, but... Ethel DeLoach of Florham Park, New Jersey, is treating a patient for arthritis. It is very painful. She exerts only psychic energy at the acupuncture points. She is doing what others do with needles, redirecting the electrical impulses that run through our body. With special equipment developed by the Russian electronics expert, Semyon Kirlian, photographs were taken of the energy emanating from Ethel's fingertips. First, when she was not healing, then while she was healing. There is a dramatic change. Bright reds and oranges indicate something is happening in Ethel's hand. Kirlian photographs are made by introducing a small amount of high voltage, high frequency current to the objects being photographed. All forms of life emit such discharges. They cannot be seen by the naked eye, but can be photographed with Kirlian equipment. These energies are sometimes described as auras, as our other bodies or as the Russians call them, our bioplasmic bodies. Whether the high voltage photograph taken of the corona discharge of a human hand is actually a picture of the aura that psychics say surround us all is still debatable. Many researchers hope they were one and the same, for it would mean that there was laboratory proof for a phenomenon rarely seen, even by psychics. We all have auras, wrote Edgar Cayce. He could see them with the naked eye. He said the aura was a blending of colors with one color dominating, and that it surrounds us from head to toe, providing us, in effect, with a second body. 
a spiritual body. The aura, Casey wrote, is the weather vane of the soul. It shows which way the winds of destiny are blowing. According to Casey, a person whose aura is predominantly red is a person of force and vigor. Blue, he said, is the color of the spiritual minded. Yellow is the color of healthy, happy individuals. Green is the color emanating from healers like doctors and nurses. White is the perfect color, the color of purity. Are these auras part of our other body, what psychics call our astral body, or what a French astronomer once termed our fluid body, or what religion calls our soul? It is this side of ourselves that researchers today are most intensely studying. They feel that it is the most important part of the work they are doing. They are looking through the keyhole of eternity, studying close up for the first time on a comprehensive research basis, the question of our survival after death. One way to test the possibilities of our having these other bodies is to examine a phenomenon known as astral projection or out-of-body travel. This is Tom Paris. Under the supervision of Dr. Adrian Van Oker, he is about to attempt astral projection. He's going to try to will his other body, his astral body, to leave his physical body and to travel here. See what I'm doing. Then he's going to return to his own body. Upon waking to prove he has been here, he will report what he saw in this house. Tom Paris has never been in this house. He does not know what this room looks like. I will have energy. I will have energy. I am energy. To achieve astral projection, Tom must narrow his bodily concentration to a solar plexus. He must imagine himself leaving his body, pick a point in space, float toward it. Was Tom Paris here? Could he have been here? Let's find out. I, I describe it as being like a light, a spot of consciousness. It, it feels like light, like I was light. Can you describe what you saw? Yes. He was sitting on a, a green plaid couch by his fireplace. And as I entered the room, he seemed to feel a chill. He, he rubbed his arm and his shoulder. And he might have seen me because as I, I passed in front of him, well, between him and the fireplace, he looked stunned, kind of surprised. Then he got up and he started moving about the room. He has a, um, a Tahitian painting on his wall, and the book he was reading was an Agatha Christie mystery. What you have just seen actually happened at a controlled experiment held under the auspices of the Society for Psychic Research in Durham, North Carolina. It is something that is happening a great deal now as researchers test subjects who claim to have had out-of-body experiences. Some claim to have traveled great distances out of body, even to other planets. But more interesting are the spirit journeys taken by patients on deathbeds and by those who have survived after having been pronounced clinically dead. They tell of journeys to the other side, like Victor Solo of New York City. I remember a very powerful grid of energy. Solo was clinically dead for 28 minutes. He describes what 
he experienced during that time. Which I did not want to touch. I didn't want to get close to it. And I sort of had a very strong sense of resistance, but I was moving towards that grid with quite an irresistible force. I was quite reluctant to approach it, but I couldn't help it. And the moment I was in the grid, uh, things change in a very radical form. I think people do not die. I think you simply step from one room into another room, like you step from one dimension into another dimension. If we continue to exist after our physical bodies die, if there is another world on the other side, is it possible to communicate from one world to the other? One way of communicating between these two worlds is with the help of a medium at what is popularly known as a seance. Here in this room, under controlled circumstances, in full light, observed by our two cameras, the medium, Reverend Dorothy Vallis, is about to conduct a seance. All mediums claim contacts in the other world. Reverend Vallis contacts a doctor. Dr. Sarah speaking. Hello, Dr. Sir. Welcome. During this seance, two people will I attempt to contact the spirits of friends who have only recently died. Yes, I um, recently had an acquaintance that crossed over, a girl. Gloria Omar. I wonder if you would like the name. I feel that that's probably the spirit that may have been trying to come through. Would you like a name? You want the name? I do not need names. The medium before going into her trance had no apparent knowledge of Gloria's deceased friend. Into the Valix, Gloria. Yes. <clears throat> the hands were held with the crossing. Yes. You know this. Yes, I do. Because you sent this energy yourself. Yes. She is over. Yes. But she is the petite one we call. And you know why we call her the petite one? Gloria? Yes, I believe I do. Yes. Child is like a new penny because the hair was quite unusual. Speak to me, Gloria. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Thank you very much. Dr. Bravin has a question he'd like to ask. There's, yes, doctor. There's someone who passed on Recently. Dr. Martin Bravin, a psychologist. I feel this is a man's vibration, doctor. <laughs> I still have my sense of humor. Often the medium assumes the vocal patterns of the prospective spiritual contact. I was outspoken. And my language of earth at times wasn't very nice. Speak to me. Here the medium has struck a responsive note in those who knew now, the deceased. I'd like to say what I want to say. She will also come up with his name. But under conditions, I'm not going to. I'm learning. But I send strength to many. You know, they call me Belle. Mm -hmm. yeah. She adds to the evidence with I an appropriate was... nickname. Many of them call me that. <laughs> What's that? You know, I'm the old workhorse. Yes. <laughs> but now... We asked I'm the participants what they thought of the seance. Uh, yes, I feel that uh, Reverend Ballas did indeed reach a young woman, a friend of mine who has recently been in an accident. Her name was... Fran Rowe, and the reason I felt like that is because she mentioned her hands being held down and the um, brightness of her hair, and she did indeed have golden hair, and the fact that she mentioned uh, that she, they called her uh, petite. Uh, several um, months before the accident, she had lost a tremendous amount of weight, and uh, the whole thing tied in. The information that she gave, including the name Bill, uh, was right on. I found that as I was listening to her, I felt as though some communication was taking place. 
The presence of spirits and the levitation of tables at seances have often been exposed as tricks by many investigators, including the late Harry Houdini. The famous escape artist and magician attended seances around the world in hopes of contacting the spirit of his dead mother. He failed. However, he vowed that after his own death, he would make every effort to communicate a message from the other side. All right, ladies and gentlemen. To protect against fit, fraud, he gave the message only to his wife. She placed it in a vault. And hands touching. Then in 1928, the medium Art Ford conducted an historical seance. It began with Ford contacting his usual spirit guide in the other world, a childhood friend called Fletcher, who was killed during World War I. There is a man here, Harry Houdini. He wishes to communicate with his wife. He wishes a message be delivered. The message will be in code. Uh, Rosabel, answer. Tell. The code was that used by Houdini and his wife during their mental Pray telepathy answer. nightclub act, a code known only to the two of them. Each word Look. represented another letter of the alphabet. Tell. Answer, answer. Decoded, the message read, Rosabelle, believe. Houdini says, please give her this message. Mrs. Houdini, who was not present at the seance, later confirmed that this was the message her husband had vowed to send back. This communication box. Hartford died in 1971. Since his death, he has reportedly been in contact with newspaper writer Ruth Montgomery. One of the leading political correspondents of our time, Miss Montgomery shocked her readers with accounts of her daily writing sessions with Art Ford's spirit. Here she tells of her earliest contact with Ford's spirit. Well, he first of all told of his own passing, saying that uh, there I was lying in, in excruciating pain in my hospital bed, and suddenly I was free. I felt like a boy again. He said he saw his mother and sister and friends coming to greet him. And then he went on to tell about uh, other souls over there and what they do and, and what it's like to be on the other side. I've had tens of thousands of letters from that book, and, and so many of them start out, you have removed all fear of death from me. I, I used to be terrified of it, and now I, I feel no fear at all. Well, I feel that, to me at least, it proves survival after death. There's no question in my mind anymore but what we survive as, as personalities, as, as individuals. These three men, father and sons, the Veilleux family of Waterville, Maine, advance several photographs they have taken as additional proof of the survival of the spirit. Following instructions they claim to have received from spirits in the other world, they have taken pictures at appointed times and places. This was the first of two pictures made after one such communication. The second showed a spirit-like image of a young woman. The spirit images they photograph are not visible to the naked eye. They appear only on the negative after processing.
The Veyu photographs are still not documented, but one picture has convinced many of their legitimacy. It is a spirit photograph of this man, Bob Brown, shown here in the only known real-life picture ever taken of him. Without any knowledge of that original photograph, the Veyus produced this spirit-like image of Brown. In earlier times, if you had heard people talking about spirits, about shadow bodies surviving death, you would have labeled the tales they told as ghost stories, fantasies to be read on a wintry night by a warm fire, something to enjoy or muse about on Halloween. But ghosts apparently do exist. We have the research done on seances, the testimony of seasoned observers, and now brand new discoveries the tape recordings of voices thought to belong to the dead. Pioneered by the late Dr. Constantine Radeve of West Germany, the technique for recording these voices is very simple. And I remember at that point, uh, Those who are currently involved in the taping of spirit voices like Scott Rogo, Attila Von Zele, and Raymond Bayliss tell us that any conventional tape recorder can be used for the purpose. Spirit voices, they say, can be recorded anywhere. However, they can only be heard when played back on the tape. Say, one day at the studio, a girl walked in. We got to discussing psychic phenomena and so on. She said, she, oh, I've got a uh, couple of dresses belonging to Sharon Tate. I got them over at Columbia Studio. I got them from her, and this one has a label inscribed Sharon Tate, Columbia Studios. This one doesn't. So I decided to hold a tape recording and session and try to contact uh, Sharon and ask her whether or not these shirts were authentic. Did, were they really her shirts, her dresses? And the voice came in and says, keep the shirt, indicating that this one is suspect and that this one is genuine. Mr. Von Zele is playing back a voice he alleges is a spirit voice. Keep the shirt, the female voice said. For study purposes, he has re-recorded it several times. Well, actually, this, this tape you know, prompts me to start thinking about, of course, the main issue that we're, we're talking about here, which is where do the voices come from? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there, there's, there's two possible answers. Either we are somehow communicating through your psychic ability with discarnate entities, or somehow through your own PK ability, you are somehow psychokinetically affecting something to get those voices on the tape. Spirit voices or psychokinesis? To further examine spirit voice tapes, our cameras visited the Southern California Cemetery along with Mr. and Mrs. Harry Shepard, two other researchers of these phenomena. They are attempting to communicate with spirits still trapped on an earthly plane. Like others in the field, the Shepherds claim to have taped hundreds of spirit voices. Here are only two of them, still undocumented. Recorded at a cemetery not unlike this one. The best evidence for the existence of spirits is that presented by residents of haunted houses, like Mrs. Linda Clark. I've uh, never believed in ghosts or anything like that. In fact, I'm not sure that I do now. Except uh, I've no way to explain what happened that evening. My husband was uh, working late, and my son Billy and I were in the living room playing Monopoly. $200, please, for passing go. You've got all the money. 
that's the way it should be. What was that? What is it? Nothing, honey. Well, I still hear it. many reasons for a ghost to return, sometimes not to haunt, but simply to communicate with loved ones still of this world. Others return to try to break free from a violent and emotional bond that keeps their spirits tied to a certain place. I'm at the United States Coast Guard Lighthouse at Point Vicente, California, south of Los Angeles. Several times in the last few years, members of the Coast Guard, young men with stable psychological profiles, have reported seeing the ghost of a young woman here. They've seen her above where the great light turns and below in the rocks near the crashing surf. There are many stories as to whom this spirit is and how and why she dwells here at Land's End. With me now is Peter Herkos, the famous Dutch psychic who lives nearby in Los Angeles. Peter, why did you pick this particular day to come here? Well, uh, why? I like it to uh, tune in up at this really ghost. Up there? Yeah. Up there. Psychics are often used to determine if a dwelling is haunted. They attempt to contact the spirit itself or read the auras lingering in the walls and floors. In this instance, Peter Herkos is being asked to tell us if there is any truth in his opinion to the story about the ghost. Raymond, what I feel, it's not a hoax, but it is a different story as anybody Expect, I've uh, picked up vibrations from around that tell you what the story is. Uh, it was happening exactly about 2.30 uh, 2 in the middle of the night. The ghost Peter tells us is that of a young girl who killed herself after watching her boyfriend die in an accident. 
she must be very much in love with him that time. And uh, she blamed herself that she thought she killed him and he didn't kill him, but he fell off, he was drunk and fell off the cliff. Or she must have done something in herself, I don't know what, she did suicide, but she didn't die on a normal death. Uh, she had dark hair, looks like an Indian type, but she's not Indian. It's more an uh, Italian type, uh, olive uh, fish. The girl's spirit, according to Mr. Herkos, returns each night at the time of her boyfriend's death. And according to the accounts given by various Coast Guardsmen, such a spirit does walk here. She walks, they say, at the ghostly hour of 3 a.m. Ghosts have never been photographed on motion picture film. But there are these several startling still photographs. They are vague and mysterious, but they still represent the only manifestation of a life energy we are still learning about. Spirits have been photographed in the great houses of Germany and at this church in England. This startling photograph was taken at the grave of the poet Yeats in Ireland. And this one at a cemetery in America. But mostly, ghosts are not seen, they are heard. A ghost is often heard here in the dormitory of a boys' school in New England. Converted from an old family mansion, the school is said to be haunted by the spirit of a young woman who died on her wedding day. Did you hear that? Ray, can you hear that? Oh, leave me alone. Occasionally, one of the students claims to have seen the ghost. ghosts is based on the premise that energy and matter cannot be destroyed, only transformed. The same premise supports the theory of reincarnation. At the University of Virginia, where Dr. Ian Stevenson is studying reincarnation, there is evidence that we do return to Earth time and again in other bodies. Edgar Cayce believed this, and Taylor Caldwell's novels are said to be based on a knowledge of her past lives. Mozart's childhood musical genius is attributed to his having lived a former life as a musical artist. Other geniuses like Benjamin Franklin and Mark Twain believed they were reincarnates. General George Patton believed he was a great general because he had been a military man in a past life. Researchers validate the accounts of reincarnation by checking out the details of the regressed person's previous life against the documented facts of that life. For instance, in one case in India, researchers verified a young girl's memory of a past life by finding money she said she had concealed in a town she had never visited or even known about in this life. Another way to validate reincarnation is by going back well, in time through I've hypnosis. Well, I've been hypnotized many different times during my lifetime. And, Roger uh, Doyle. During these sessions, I regressed, of course, into a different life. As a matter of fact, many different lives. Uh, I think one of the most interesting, perhaps, was as a Spanish soldier. Uh, 
during the 16th century uh, with Cortez. Doyle's knowledge of the Spanish conquistadors' conquest of Mexico, as remembered under hypnosis, was complete and detailed. recall of the habits of both the coastal and central Mexican Indians was that either of a scholar or of someone who had been there. In another period of hypnosis and during regression, of course, I discovered that I had been killed. And it occurred after Montezuma's death and during the time that the Aztec warriors were warring on us and driving us out of Mexico City. Fantasy, dream, or the product of a fertile imagination. Stories like Roger Doyle's can be either. Or they can be what they say they are. Actual accounts of the adventures of past lives. The mysteries of the world of psychic phenomena are many. They stagger the conventional imagination. Yet with each passing year, stories we thought were bizarre, like Roger Doyle's tale of marching and fighting with Cortez, become commonplace. The strange and the unknown are becoming the familiar. The shroud of mystery is falling away. Acceptance of psychic phenomena is growing. Belief in it has grown, as the evidence for it has grown. For many, this evidence is absolute proof that these psychic powers do exist. Most of the skeptics now agree that at least some of these strange and mysterious forces exist in all of us. Men of science now tell us that we are indeed different beings than we thought we were. We are, they say, psychic beings. And if we're not afraid to push back the boundaries of our ignorance, if we learn to channel our latent powers, we might be able to alter the future in a way that we now can only imagine. We might perhaps think of communicating across the great barren stretches of outer space using telepathy. We might even solve the mystery of time and teletransportation and move freely from planet to planet, galaxy to galaxy. We are indeed different beings than we thought we were. We are energy made of the same stuff as the stars. We are energy, and we are forever.